welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, first a brief introduction about our guest. Uh, so Silvia Federici is a longtime feminist activist, scholar and teacher. In 1972, she was among the founders of the International Feminist Collective, the organization that launched the campaign for wages for housework in the US and abroad. Uh, she has also been active in the, in the anti-globalization movement and the anti-death penalty movement and was a founding member of the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa, which for more than 10 years had documented the struggle of African students against the austerity programs imposed by the IMF and the World Bank on African countries. She has taught in the US and in Nigeria and is Professor Emerita of Political Philosophy and International Studies at Hofstra University. She's the author of, of many books and essays on political philosophy, feminist theory, cultural studies, education, and more recently, the worldwide struggle against capitalist globalization and for a feminist reconstruction of the uh, commons. So as Marta said, uh, this evening's event, uh, uh, so it's the last one in this Architectures of Care series, uh, the, and the format will be a bit different. Uh, so we've invited, uh, we've asked our guest uh, not to give a lecture, a formal presentation, but to engage in a conversation with all of us. So Marta and myself uh, will begin with a few questions to, to Silvia, and we hope we, you will all join us uh, either by posting questions or comments in the chat or, or raising your hand and talking directly uh, to, to all of us. Now, I, it's very difficult in fact, to begin that. I didn't know really how to begin this conversation. I wanted, I decided to start with a personal story. So many years ago, I, I took a class, uh, when I was a graduate student, I took a class uh, with David Harvey at the Q, at CUNY's Graduate Center a class title, Reading Marx's Capital. I had read Marx and uh, Marxist literature for, for a while then, but, uh, but very unsystematically. And I decided uh, to study Marx properly. So in that class, uh, so we read Marx. For an entire semester, we read week by week, we read chapter by chapter, we read uh, volume one of Capital and explored in some detail um, the factory system, uh, the production of commodities, uh, use value, exchange value, labor power, etc. And one of the most interesting moments for me of that course uh, was at the very end, in the final session, when a woman in the class asked the question. And she asked, uh, she said, we've been studying for an entire semester the question of production, of work, of factory work, of wage work. What about other kinds of work? What about domestic work? What about child rearing? What about care work? And that question for me was, was eye-opening. Uh, the emphasis in, in much of what I had read up to that point uh, was always on production, production for the market as the only activity that creates wealth. Reproduction, social reproduction was always at the margins of Marxist literature. And, and Sylvia, your work is fundamentally concerned with reproduction, with reproductive labor, with the work that is literally necessary for sustaining uh, life, and with the ways in which uh, our society fundamentally devalues, uh, undervalues, or ignores uh, that work. And perhaps really the best way to begin this conversation is to ask you, how did you come to study reproduction and why is it so central to your analysis of, of capitalism? Yeah, thank you, Cesare, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, greetings to, to everybody who is listening. Uh, well, you know, I, I came, I guess there are several reasons, and some are the deep reason, which is, um, you know, uh, growing up in a family in post-war Italy, you know, with a mother who was a full-time housewife, and uh, seeing her work seeing her complain that her work was never valued, that she never had a moment for herself, and seeing the battle that my sister and I always made to escape this work. And we knew, both of us, that you know, whatever else we'll do in life, we didn't want to become housewives. And uh, so this was very deep, was constitutive of my personality and my conception of what my life in the world would be. 
and uh, and also of course uh, Italy was extremely patriarchal and uh, and in many ways still is and not only Italy but uh, clearly when the feminist movement began and we began to look for the, the roots of the specific forms of oppression the women have suffered in capitalist society you know, the question of domestic work the question of domestic work really came to the forefront and i felt i always knew that uh, domestic work was uh, a key component of uh, you know the work that reproduces the society and and then this work was totally devalued uh, adding to that you know, I happened to read in 1972 an essay by an Italian feminist, Maria Rosa Dalla Costa, called The Power of Women and Subversion of the Community, called Women and the Subversion of the Community. And uh, that article was an eye opening for me um, because it was an article that analyzed domestic work from in a way a Marxist perspective, ironically, because Marx never speaks of domestic work, right? But uh, what Maria Rosa de la Costa did in their work, in a way, was to extend, you know, Marxist analysis of the reproduction of the workforce, which in Marx takes place only through the market. In other words, Marx has the idea, you know, that the workforce, you know, every day people have to get up, go to work, et cetera, et cetera. They have to feed themselves. But the way Marx represents it, you know, is that the workers reproduce themselves only through the market. In other words, they buy things, they consume them, and they reproduce themselves this way. In Marx, there is no really, there is no trace of housework, of domestic work. What Maria Rosa de la Costa did, however, was to take the concept, the reproduction of the workforce, and extend it to housework. And in fact, her argument was that the housewife, the houseworker, is a central figure in the process of capitalist accumulation. You know, because their work, domestic work, that is always seen as pertaining to the private personal sphere, it's often seen as a personal service, almost like a leftover from a earlier, you know, economic age. She actually saw very brilliantly that their work is in fact a key component, in fact, is the central, essential component you know, of the reproduction of the workforce, you know, because from procreation and to all the daily activities. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, she obviously, she pointed out that this work is devalued because if the capitalist class had to compensate for it, had to pay for it, uh, it would not be able to accumulate. In other words, like much of the process of capitalist accumulation has taken place at the expense of women, has taken place off the shoulder of women, right? By presenting this work, by creating this artificial separation between production and reproduction, as if they were two separate, completely separate spheres, and in a way relegating, relegating reproductive work, you know, to a sphere that seems, appears, to fall out of the economic sphere, of the sphere of economic relation, but of course it does not, right? And so uh, when I read that article, uh, everything fell into place, <laughs> everything fell into place. And so from that point of view, to me, the issue of reproduction has become very, very different, it's become the, the support structure, reproductive work, you know, and obviously the reproductive work continues outside of the home. It's not taking place only, you know, nursing and education, et cetera, et cetera, you know? But, but the domestic work still remains, still is the core. And not accidentally, 
you know, uh, women's reproductive activity have been the subject of a tremendous control on the side of the state. Think of all the controls that have been placed to this day on abortion, on procreation. Think of all the laws and control that have been placed on women's sexuality, right? Because it's clear that both procreation and sexuality are not outside of the economic sphere. You know, are in fact central cogs, if you want to call it this way, in the process of capitalist accumulation. That's why the state is extremely alert and extremely vigilant and extremely repressive, you know, in, in that regard. So this is how I came, I came to it. And of course, my own concept of reproduction, as well as the other women with whom my work uh, has expanded over the years. You know, today for me, reproduction also extends to agricultural subsistence agriculture, for instance, because I lived in Africa and I've seen that for many women, the cooking begins in the garden, you know, where you plant things, not for the market, but for the family, etc. So that kind of agriculture, the defense of the environment, you know, the relationship to the natural world is also part of reproduction. So there are many, many activities that, uh, you know, in the 70s, we were not focused upon. But very soon with the rise of ecofeminism, you know, we began to really expand, you know, in a, in a, in a much broader way. Follow up quickly on on this uh, on this idea of uh, of, of reproduction, because uh, you've been writing, in fact, of, of of these issues for now for for several decades, yes. and uh, um, but they have again become prominent, in fact, uh, very recently, in particular in, in 2020. So, which has been uh, so with the pandemic that seems to have laid bare the some of the realities of capitalism. Uh, and uh, and it, it has been a, a kind of year of, of reckoning. Uh, I'm thinking in particular, like from what you said about the recent debates or last year's debates uh, about labor, about uh, so-called essential labor. Yes. Uh, um, that, that I, I think that, that your yes. analysis of representing, uh, in fact, decades before this was already pointing to the yes. to, to that uh, to that to that idea. Absolutely. Uh, what is more essential, you know, for example, than all the work that goes into procreation and child raising, you know, without that you have no workforce. Without that there's absolutely no workforce. So those are extremely essential forms of work. Mm -hmm. And that daily reproduction, the daily activity, you know, in a way, you know, is what has kept the economy going. You know, there is uh, uh, domestic work, a uh, paid domestic work, and in Spain, uh, there is an organization called Territorio Domestico Activo, and they say without us, nothing is moving, and uh, it's quite appropriate, you know, because the reproductive work, you know, in 1975, women in Iceland, you know, called a women's strike. And because the country is small and they have a whole network of women council in every neighborhood, they were actually able to have a complete women's strike. And the work stopped because you cannot have, you know, factories going, offices, schools, when the children are in the home alone, when the women are crossing their arms. And for a day, the economic world, the recognized economic world had to stop so that the men would replace the women. So this, uh, the, the issue of, um, you know, what is the essential work and what is the world that really keep the economic world moving? Uh, it's, uh, it's fundamental. And uh, it was in a way uh, interesting that during the pandemic, you know, people were woken up to the work that the nurses are doing and other works are doing. Because in fact, this is part of activities that have also been devalued. 
you know, because nursing in a way is seen as an extension of housework. Remember that historically for a long, long time, almost into the 19th century, much of the healing work in many society uh, was done by women. Women were the healers. In the Middle Ages, they were the main healers. You didn't have a, a you know, institutionally legalized medical professor, profession. Women had a, a garden with herbs, with plants. They learned the, part, the properties of plants and they cured. And you know, this devaluation of housework and reproductive activity has also affected many, many activities when housework goes out of the home, when it enters the hospital, when it becomes nursing, when it becomes paid domestic work, all those activity, education, right, suffer the same devaluation. And not accidentally, they are performed primarily by women, right? So there's a whole vast um, female world of, of and, uh, the product, world of reproductive activities that has been uh, made invisible in its uh, essential economic importance. And, uh, and, but the invisibility begins in the home. You know? It's that work that is being naturalized, has been seen as a natural product of women's propensity, et cetera, et cetera. But all this is very convenient. This is extremely convenient because it means that we are this universe of activities that are keeping the world, the economic, the workforce going, right, has been done at, at extremely, um, has cost very little, you know, to, to capitalist class. I want to say, Marta, and that everyone else, in fact, so feel free to jump in uh, at, at, at any point. I have a number of, 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 of questions. So one, in fact, uh, so it's not really a question, but, uh, you know, this question of the home. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm thinking now of the, of the work of, uh, uh, of Dolores Hayden. Uh, yeah. So within architecture, so the, uh, in fact, also of the work of Marta Gatman. Uh, so of histories of, of various experiences to, to um, how to say, to deprivatize the home uh -huh. uh, and, and domestic work uh, to, to, with the construction of buildings uh, with, with collective kitchens uh, or, or urban plants uh, centered on, on, on cooperative, uh, of cooperative housing. Uh, so there's, there's definitely like a, a, a tradition within, uh, within ar architecture of experiments uh, in, right. in precisely in this uh, in this in this direction and not accidentally those as Dolores Hayden's proof demonstrates very well those who put forward these programs were women right because it was uh, from there really a need to break down the isolation hmm? because uh, the the invisibilization of housework the confinement of housework to the private sphere has also meant, you know, that uh, the home has become a kind of jail for women, right? The home has become a kind of secluded space that isolates women mm -hmm. and in fact forces them not only to work alone, but actually face all their crisis and all their suffering alone. So very, very soon, you know, and Dolores Hayden, in the United States dates, you know, this uh, revolt to at the end of the 19th century, where you have revolutionary women, reformist women, you know, um, basically developing all kinds of schemes to break down, you know, this uh, isolation of the home. And as you said, for example, create buildings that, uh, eliminate the kitchen in the apartments and have a collective kitchen on the ground floor. In fact, Dolores Iden, I think, points out that in New York, the first restaurants were a consequence, were modeled 
on these buildings, they were very revolutionary that, um, you know, feminists uh, were, were uh, imagining and in some case actualizing, you know, so that uh, some of these activity would be done in common. Some of these activities would not be any longer performed in the isolation of the home. I think today there's a much broader movement you know, to commonize reproductive work, you know, and uh, not only the kitchen, you know, but for example, uh, you know, the creation of, uh, you know, urban gardens and uh, the creation of uh, committees that uh, guarantee, for example, to children certain types of care that are done by women collectively. This is done above all in Latin America. So the impulse to basically reunite, right? Reconnect you know, spaces, you know, to break down the walls, to create collective forms of reproduction is very, very strong. And as Hayden pointed out, the organization you know, of domestic space is for women a labor issue. The organization of domestic space is a labor issue. The small kitchen, for instance, you know, these mini apartments that we have now with a small kitchen where one person, right, is a kitchen that condemns those who are doing the cooking, the cleaning to isolation, eh? to condemn them to be alone. The broad kitchen with a lot of people is one where there is a continuous cooperation in the work, where not only you work, but you talk, you exchange information, you know, you share things, you have emotional links that are formed. So the work is not separated from social relations. This is possible if you have a space. And, you know, I know that I'm speaking to future architects. We need an architectural revolution. And I know that women have been wanting, demanding, and experimenting with architectural evolution, you know, wanting different forms of space for a long time. Because, you know, this, uh, this, uh, the trend that capitalism has taken is a trend that kills us. It's a trend that transforms work that potentially could also be creative work. Of course, the question of remuneration, the question of resources is, is, is humongous, right? But connected with the economic devaluation is the isolation in which this work has been performed, right? And when the work is done collectively, collective cooking, for example, as we know, right, is a very different operation from a cooking or a cleaning that is done always every day alone, et cetera, et cetera. And so the reorganization of space and the reorganization of reproduction are one and the same. And they have to be done, you know, simultaneously. And I'm, well, I'm gonna press you on, on, on some of the things that came out in particular. So with the idea of the, of the commons, and I, I think so I'm thinking now of, of uh, again, your, your recent book, uh, the uh, Reenchanting the World, uh, uh, Feminism and the Policy of the Commons. There's an essay that I, that I uh, that was really interesting for me that one, an essay that you wrote with your partner with George uh, uh, Catherine, Catherine titled Commons Against and Beyond Capitalism, which you argue about the, the need or the possibility to reverse uh, enclosure. To yeah. reverse the process whereby the world became divided uh, and contained for profit. Uh, so, with capitalism having enclosed nearly everything uh, land, water, our very bodies, our very minds. Uh, and the way, so you argue that the way to reverse uh, this, this process is to turn more and more of the world into, into a commons. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps I'd like you to, to speak more about uh, the commons or, or perhaps the practices of commoning, like perhaps yeah. some, some, 
Uh, so the practice of putting our resources, so material as well as cultural resources, outside of the market, outside of the reach of commodification or right. extraction. In fact, I also wanted to ask you to, to say more about the very title of that book, Re-Enchanting the, the World. How do we re-enchant the world? Yeah, well, to me, okay, two things. One about enchanting, you know, it was polemical with Max Weber, right? Max Weber speaks of the fact that capitalism disenchants the world and disenchants the world because submits the world to a kind of rationality. Everything is rationalized. Everything is looked in terms of quantities and number and bureaucracies. And, uh, and I wanted to I say that's not enough. Right? The disenchantment of the world you know, has come, first of all, from the, the enclosure, right? the expropriation, the separation of human beings you know, from uh, the land from uh, you know the natural the natural wealth from animals it's been uh, you know this uh, a separation whereby in effect uh, you know human being looks at the natural world from the point of view in a very exploitative instrumental instrumental way so this was the polemic and i wanted to say the enchant in the world means also change you know, our relation with each other, our relation with nature, with animals. It means to reconnect, this is be my, reconnect what capitalism has divided, you know, and recuperate the sense of, uh, of beauty, of magic that, uh, you know, I think uh, it's always potentially there that uh, once we approach the world in a non-market you know, dimension, not from the point of view of profit-making, marketing and selling, et cetera. And so part of the enchantment was to, in fact, create different types of relation, a relation that go beyond the drive, capitalist drive to individualize our life. Right? to separate us from each other, to not only separate us, but project an image of the other as a threat, as a, a competitor, as a threat. And, and this is to me the kind of destruction that we have to fight against. So the enchanting is to weave in back, is to weave back the tapestry you know, of, of our life, of our relationship with other people, and not only ideologically, but it has to in the materiality of everyday life, in the material production of everyday life, you know, to actually do things together, you know, until no long ago, for example, mostly productive activity in the villages, you know, were done in a very common in way, you know, often women uh, washed uh, they're close together. You know, if you go to many Italian cities, you can still see in the center of the village, you know, the, 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 the tubs, the cement tubs, where women who go to wash their clothes, not separate from each other in, uh, in, in their rooms, in their isolated room, but collectively, you know, I still remember as a child, you know, I was born during World War II, and uh, I spent the first years of my life in a farm because the towns were continuously bombed. And I remember the women always uh, washed clothes together, you know, did things together. That kind of collectivity, right? It's a very, it's a great strength. It's a great strength. It helps you to overcome many crises. It helps you to expand your knowledge, your understanding. It gives you the strength to face the world, mm -hmm. to struggle with the state, to struggle with the authorities. You know, the moment you are isolated, you are already defeated. This is what I meant by enchanting the world, is to recuperate it also the power of collective decision-making. Um... Oh, uh... Um, I, I, can I say something? 
I, I just I'm so taken with your words, uh, Sylvia. They're they're so so, and your concepts are so so powerful. I, and there's so many questions I'd like I'd like to ask. Um, but Chase Ray's asked a lot of them already, um, or touched on touched on topics particularly. I was inter one of the topics I was I was very uh, taken with the references to Weber, to Lefebvre, uh, to um, and uh, to Hayden in 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 your work, and I wondered coming from the position that you did, right, which is what happened to your, from the positions you, you, intellectual traditions you come from, from a very rigorous Italian Marxist background, how does the, how did the encounter with Hayden or the encounter with Lefebvre say, change your take on, to what degree was it, how did it, it shift your, your consciousness? Uh, um, and in, I guess particularly, thinking here of, um, of Hayden's concept of material feminism, which is, which is explicitly anti-Marxist, right? Well, I am not sure that this is because I didn't see any conflict. Yeah. But you see, first of all, first of all, uh, Marxism, you know, I'm always defined as a Marxist. Am I a Marxist? Well, I'm a Marxist perhaps because I, grew up reading Marx and I've learned a lot and I still I still see that despite a lot of criticism I have of Marx, there are certain fundamental elements. To me, the fact that capitalism is built on the exploitation of women of human labor, the building of a society that does not exploit labor. And secondly, the idea of a society where those who produce are those also who will uh, have make the decision, uh, you know, collectively, a society where the, governed by the principle, you know, to everybody according to their needs and from everybody according to their possibilities. Yeah? These are all very very good principles for me. On the other hand, I'm also very critical of Marx. So I'm not sure that I'm really a Marxist because I don't agree, for instance, uh, with the Marxian idea that capitalism was a kind of necessary evil you know, and uh, still was a progressive force because you know, by expanding the productivity of labor, you know, it laid the material basis for the future communist society. We are now seeing that in fact, the great large scale industry, automation, et cetera, et cetera, the Marx thought was going to be essential to overcome scarcity and to produce the basis for the new society is now destroying the world, right? And the technology has produced a whole new level of armaments, you know, well now have immense threat on even on the survival of the human species. So in that sense, I'm not a Marxist because there are really some fundamental of Marx that I never accept. So to me, actually the encounter with Dolores Heiser was a love affair because uh, I, I thought that, um, you know, uh, very powerful, I, the grand domestic revolution, redesigning the American dream where she describes, for instance, the way work and the home and the neighborhood were reorganized after World War II. It was so powerful, you know, how, how basically the state developed a science of separating people in suburbia, in all the little houses and how politically, profoundly politically, uh, you know, were, were the conception of, of how, housing and domestic space should be organized. You know, uh, she points out, for instance, that uh, they put a lawn into every home, you know, so that the man, if he had times on Sunday, would not go to the union, would not go to the saloon and uh, make trouble, but would mourn the lawn. And so you have millions and millions of workers right, who on Sunday go back and forth. This idea of, you know, make them property owner, give them a house and, you know, there goes the revolution. Mm -hmm. 
the particular room for the for the woman, you know, the iron involved in everything, the way they studied, the organization of domestic space, from the point of view of the reproduction work, but and also of politically pacifying these people, mm -hmm. right? Of destroying the revolution, they were terrified of all these GIs coming back. The, you know, they have been years in war develop a profound comradeship with the other men. You know, they were coming home thinking they fought for democracy and they know how to fight. They knew how to fight. So they were terrified of them and they devised this perfect, you know, uh, dream house to completely demobilize them. I mean, her description I think was very, very powerful. And how when the war began and they had to attract women into the bombing industry, right? They created this model village where a woman could go deposit the child, deposit the dirty clothes, and at night come back and everything was done for her, right? Come the end of the war and those villages were destroyed. I mean, that description, I think was extremely insightful and extremely powerful. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot from that and as a kind also of uh, a model for understanding the present, for understanding all the transformation of the home and the neighborhood that have taken place since, you know, and, uh, and seeing that they're not casual or they're not, uh, you know, driven purely by pure economy, but there's a politics built into them and understanding what is the politics. Yeah. Yeah, so, so building on that, on that powerful description of post-war suburbia, I, I think our students and faculty would be super interested to hear about some of your work in Africa and Latin America and the mm -hmm. ways in which the encounters with women and space and resistance uh, changed your yeah. thinking. Uh, it's Very much, yeah. Quite, because... a, quite a strong theme in this set, uh, set of, of, of essays. And just, just to say, to add in, if you wouldn't mind speaking a bit about, um, um, about your thinking of primitive accumulation, I was blown away by your theorizing on that, but it, mm. it, yeah, in any event. Yeah, well, to me, actually, the whole issue of the commons, the, the whole issue of the commons really came from the time I spent in Nigeria and then later, you know, Latin America, the Zapatista movement. This is where it came from, you know, um, by uh, very ignorantly, um, before I went to Nigeria, I, I believed that um, everywhere all land had been enclosed. I, I believe that the privatization of land was pretty much a almost universal you know, process. And I was very surprised when I actually had time to spend in Nigeria to discover that no, in fact, you know, not only in Nigeria, but in other parts of Africa, particularly yeah. in West Africa, a lot of the land had not been enclosed and was still run communally. Clearly, communally, a communalism that had undergone many changes, right? Because coloniz colonization, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, the village was still a place of the commons. And uh, so, and then, of course, you know, uh, the encounter with really much more communal forms of life that percolated in so many in changing so many things in a daily level. You know, how people uh, came together with each other, how um, you go to eat and uh, the way people ate together, the way people passed into each other's houses without necessarily making plan and, and uh, needing a permission or making an appointment. Uh, and then the great common, which is the market where you see dozens and dozens of women sitting together, selling things, talking to each other and realizing that that kind of setup requires a very, very sophisticated type of organization. 
because together with the women, many often you have the children and to organize all of that, right? It's, and it's a big, big common. The market is really a big uh, women's common. And uh, the same experience later, I had also in Latin America, in Mexico, in, uh, in Argentina. In, in Argentina, I visited, for example, many of the so-called Villas Miserias. The Villas Miserias are encampments that have been created by people expelled from the land. And when they were expelled, instead of uh, being defeated, or they would go in urban spacing, take over land and build with their own hands and collective power communities and roads. And, uh, and uh, in the process, build forms of collective decision making. And when women took me to visit them, they said, you see this road, ah, they're not keeping it well. In our section, you know, we are doing better. And they told me a lot of the decision for the environment there was taken collectively. And uh, I visit a collective kitchen. I've heard the stories of the piqueteras, you know, who uh, when uh, the big banking crisis occurred and people had no money. The money economy collapsed. Actually, they were the save the day. They brought the big pots into the streets and they began to cook in the streets collectively and began to make decisions. As a woman put it, when the money economy collapsed, another economy became visible. That economy that is always invisible and yet sustains the world. Right? And so those experiences have really deeply affected me. And, you know, nothing can be exported as it is, right? Of course, it's not a question of setting up models, you no, know, but seeing how, particularly when confronted with crisis, you know, the obvious solution is uniting, is a collective work. Is collective labor, collective decision making. How the strengths that even in the moment of the deepest crisis, the strengths that come, you know, from the power of coming together. That is something that has affected me profoundly. And then, of course, in Latin America, you meet uh, continuously people who come from indigenous communities, and they come from that experience indigenous communities that at times are also patriarchal. And yet there's something, you know, about the collective spirit that even in women from those communities who have been critical of the patriarchalism, nevertheless don't want to give up the commoning, mm -hmm. right? The sense of belonging, being part of something that is bigger than you. And, uh, and I think uh, that uh, the sense of strength and peace and connection with the world that people gain from that part of being a collectivity and the desperation that comes from feeling alone in the world. And uh, not to mention, you know, the risk of, uh, you know, the danger of, of, of uh, being completely defeated. Uh, that I think is very, very important. Uh, may I push you on, on this, on, on the commons? Uh, and the, you've written on, of, of the commons on okay, urban gardens, food co-ops. Uh, so not just as, as a place of redistribution, but also a site of production of, of, of new knowledge, uh, yeah. as well as new centers of, of sociality in the way you're yeah. discussing that. So where it becomes possible to create new forms of, of solidarity. And I find this very interesting. So the idea that these struggles, say struggles against various forms of, of dispossessions are not just a kind of defensive struggle, no. but in defending a certain communal rights, uh, you also create new realities, new alliances, and new, 
uh, I'm very fascinated by these ideas that, that resonate, in fact, uh, with, with the long history of uh, anarchist uh, thought from, from Kropotkin to, to David Graeber. Yeah. Uh, the idea that it'd be possible to have a society based on, on principle of mutual aid and self-organization. Um, at the same time, I have uh, um, issues with, with, with some of these uh, ideas. So the, the, the sort of the emancipatory potential of this type of discourse is based on the idea that you can create, let's say, an island or small islands of uh, decommodification in a sea that is thoroughly uh, commodified, and that these would have a sort of domino effects so or ripple effects uh, over the whole system. But it's hard, however, to see how, how that might come about, how small scale practices of, of commoning uh, might counteract, say, the, the power of, of big corporations. So, and uh, I think this, this question of scale to me comes up uh, a lot. So, can these practices of commoning be yeah. scaled up? In fact, are there viable sort of alternatives? Yeah, so a number of things. First of all, commons are not just a small island. Commons is a principal organization. I think this is very, very important because once you have that, then, then I think everything changes. In other words, well, you know, there are two ways of speaking of commons. So it's the collective kitchen and the urban garden, but, but those are exemplification. Those are materialization of an idea, which is a, a principle of organizing. So commons is not just those islands, but it's a way of conceiving social relation. It's a way of conceiving what we call economic relation. It's a way of conceiving the organization of a whole society. And so that's as, as a first thing. And secondly, on that principle, uh, I never suggested, actually, I do not, Others may, but I do not, that we do not also engage uh, in, for example, broad coalition. Um, I mean, recently, because of the climate change conference in Glasgow, we have seen this coming together, this new internationalism that is formed you know, around the struggle for uh, against climate change indigenous people connecting from the Americas, connecting with people in Africa. Those kind of broad coalition and broad struggle, I think are extremely important. When I speak of the, the, the island, the, the, the urban garden, uh, of the collective kitchen and et cetera, you know, I think that those are the foundation also for those broad coalitions. Those broad coalition, those broad protests, those broad movement of confrontation will never, will never actually have the power even to survive without a broad local day-to-day -day transformation that takes place in really creating a very different form of reproduction of everyday life. And that transformation you know, in fact, is what gives them the power, the strength for this other struggle to take place. So to me, and for a number of reasons, you know, first of all, you know, because uh, you have to construct, as you said before, you know, I don't believe that, that uh, this system is going to be changed by purely oppositional uh, struggle you have to construct something new. Uh, people will not actually move unless their day to life is improved. You know, very often in the past, particularly in certain male dominated organization, you know, political struggle, the so-called revolution and activism became another kind of work. Oh, another meeting, oh, another this, oh, yeah, et cetera. You know, I began very concerned. The struggle, what we call the struggle, has to transform positively. It doesn't mean that you're not suffering. You might be arrested, you might be this. But the moment the struggle becomes alienated labor, then there's something wrong. Then it's not sustainable. For the struggle to be sustainable, it has to transform everyday life in something that gives people more joy, more power, more strength. 
And that's where the commune comes in because the demonstration, et cetera, et cetera, it may be important, crucial, but is what it means in your everyday life. To what extent you can sustain that kind of activity. So to me, the two are not separable. And, uh, and to me, the common in, you know, and now, you know, used to be in many feminist organizations that I've been working work with in Latin America, in Spain, mm -hmm. women used to say, we put life at the center. Now we say we put the struggle at the center, mm -hmm. right? But we put the struggle at the center in the sense that then you have to engage in a reorganization of everyday life that also enables you to struggle. Because for most people, the reproduction of everyday life is a tremendous, tremendous challenge. There is no money, there is no time, there is going crazy, there is a lot of pain, there is a lot of suffering. To put in another meeting, to put in another hour of leafleting or something, or another hour at the internet becomes a burden. So there has to be something that instead turns those activity into something that you want to do, that gives you some strength, you know, so it has to be a kind of activity where creates solidarities, creates new emotional ties, where your life, you feel less alone and you want to go to the meeting because after the meeting, you will be, I've experienced that all through the last two years, you know, with particularly with some of the women of my group that are living around me. We now speak of our common you know, because uh, we have cooked for each other, talked to each other, supported each other. And in that way, I think uh, this is what we are talking about. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> so the, so the, the question of scale, it is not this like small scale or big scale. All the scales are necessary. All the scales are necessary. The question is, you know, whether the struggle is uh, the change is postponed to a future that continuously recede, you know, the famous revolution at the end of the millennia, or we speak of a change that actually we begin to experience now. even in a sea of pain and suffering and, 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 um, and misery. But nevertheless, something changes. Thank you. Question. Yes, Ashna, you can unmute yourself. Great, thank you so much. And I just wanna say thank you, Sylvia Federici, for sharing your ideas and wisdom. The way you were describing how when you read Maria de la Costa is how I feel about you when I read Caliban and the Witch. Um, and I'm actually, my question is related to your, you know, latest book, Patriarchy of the Wage. Um, in Counterplanning from the Kitchen, you know, you discuss this capitalist ideology of glorifying the family and how it then divides wageless labor as an act of love um, or acts of love. And I'm curious, you know, as you're talking about reenchantment and bringing back magic into our life um, in a positive way, like how do we reclaim love and acts of love and kind of associate it with that magic and no longer you know, the commodifications that we are so deeply indebted into now in society, at least in the times I've been alive, right? Like love has been commodified. I act, gift, service, cleaning, cooking for friends, cooking for family, um, cooking for partners. You know, it, I feel like it's going to take me a lot to divide the two in my own brain. And then how do we bring that then to everyone else to get on board? I, I, it really struck me right along the first chapter. I'm, I'm almost done um, with the book, but um, it was bookmarked that I wanted to bring it up, so. Yeah, I think uh, with a good great love, right? When uh, actually we begin to separate love from all this cargo of labor, because, uh, you know, love now has become the vehicle to a tremendous amount of exploitation. Oh, the great, in, you know, the great uh, passion. And then, you know, you wash dishes for the next 20 years. And uh, I think when we begin to separate the two and begin also 
to live our relation with other people, our passions and our sexuality and so on in, uh, you know, not in a climate of competition and scarcity, you know, where, where you know, the, the, you know, this one person, right, this is again part of the individualization of life. You know, and also affects the way we love, and the fact that uh, the tragedy of love becomes when everything is centered into one particular person that is supposed to fulfill all your expectation, all your desire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there has to be a harmony. So the question of love too has to be more communal, and uh, you know, and uh, so. And for instance, in the case of women, I think uh, it's so important to the fact of recuperating the capacity to love in a way that is not tragic and self-defeating, you know, is also to, you know, regain the sense of one's value, you know, by doing things, by feeling our life not uh, vicariously, you know, through the admiration that we can receive from a man or from another woman, etc. But, you know, through the things that we do and the things that we do with other people, you know. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've often noticed and commented upon is that uh, so many of the love, so many love pains so many love pains, you know, are due not to the fact that the person who was lost or from whom we are separated, you know, was essential to our life, you know, but the fact that being abandoned by a lover, you know, becomes a sense of self-devaluation, you know, because women in particular have been so much raised and trained to place their own sense of value, you know, in the admiration, the love, the care of a man, that uh, often when that person, whether they you actually uh, love that person or not, um, you feel completely devastated because being, being left by that person, you know, is interpreted you know, as a statement on who you are, what your value is. So I think that there has to be a very profound change, you know, that comes with a process of self-valorization and comes with a process also of, um, you know, expanding the range of our affection, expanding our sense of solidarity, you know, and, uh, I think that, for example, there's been a tremendous change since uh, the development of the feminist movement. You know, women used to be seen competing you know, for, for men. And I think the feminist movement changed that and or changed that in significant ways. So I think that definitely there is a way of common in love that love too has to be subjected to a process of harmony. And, and reinterpreted also from the point of view, you know, connected in, with the question of solidarity. Thank you. Can I uh, ask a question? Sure. Um, so I'm still very struck by that image that you presented earlier of the women gathering at the concrete um, ah, yes. to wash clothes together. And I am thinking about how that was about, you know, it was something that was about sharing a resource as well, right? Mm. And um, just moving into our present time. In a way, it's like such an archaic image but just moving into where we find ourselves now and um, a lot of these movements to kind of begin to think about commoning is about coming from a perspective of, you know, being resource strapped and to share resources. And I don't know why, but I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit, but also about 
ecofeminism and how that has played a part or how that has resurfaced um, yeah. in our lives now. Yeah, you know, ecofeminism, I think, has been very, very important. And uh, because uh, it has made a connection, you know, and uh, in, the, in the 80s, the rise of the ecology movement. And of course, it was a, a very obvious connection to see the question of reproduction, right? And the question of the care you know, for life. I mean, women have been the subject, the main subject of the production of human life. And to see how crucial, how important it is, you know, to fight and to defend, you know, the natural environment in which we live. So I think the ecofeminism was very much an obvious organic extension, you know, of the whole discourse over the reproduction of daily life. And uh, now we've seen it more and more through the kind of movement that are now spreading throughout Latin America, you know, where it is most often the women who are actually leading you know, the struggle against deforestation, against mining, against oil drilling, you know, because they are the ones who, who understand that once those companies are coming into the area, you know, the future of the community is doomed. Uh, soon, uh, for a short period of time, there will be some men with some money in their pocket. But after that, people will have to migrate because the rivers will be poisoned, because the cropland will be destroyed. And so you find that, for instance, the change even in the violence against women, you know, um, women like Rita Segato uh, has written a lot about it. There's a new form of violence, which is not domestic, but is the violence of paramilitaries, the violence of security guards of the companies, you know, targeting women because they have been in the forefront of many of the struggle. And uh, often fighting even with the men in their own community who are attracting by the wages that a mining company may bring into the town, you know, oblivious to the fact that uh, with those wages comes also a whole process of destruction. What is happening in the Amazon now is a tremendous, tremendous struggle of people in the Amazon. The Amazon is being burned, is being logged, and uh, it's mostly a lot of uh, women's organizations, not exclusively. Eh? So I think that that connection, and of course, uh, there's been an understanding that capitalism right, has been able to expand and accumulate, you know, taking not because of the innovative ideas and so on, but because it has appropriated, you know, um, women's unpaid labor. It has appropriated women's work and has also appropriated the, the nature of wealth, you know, without really uh, paying for it. So the great capitalist accumulation, you know, is not due to the fantastic innovative spirit, but is also due to this incredible theft of labor and theft of resources. And now you have corporations who are more and more controlling the earth more and more, you know, placing their hands, you know, on everything, on every natural wealth and expelling people by the million. We are becoming refugees. I mean, this is a world, uh, if it continues, the drive continues as it is today, where we will, after the population of the world, will be in refugee camps, you know, and the others allowed to walk into fields and houses at the service of the corporation. This cannot be, you know, I think that this is what the struggle today is about in every corner of the world. You know, who's going to decide, you know, for, that, for the destiny of, of people's life and deserve. So I think to, to, to repeat what I said before, there is a obvious, you know, uh, 
how do you say, irreducible connection you know, between the question of reproduction and the question of uh, the struggle you know, to defend you know, our natural environment, including animals and so on. This is the enchanting of the world. You know? There's a question in the chat from Matthew. Matthew, you wanna ask it yourself? Sure, sure. Um, what did I? I wrote, hello, thank you so much for your talk. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, I wrote, to what extent does the commons, which you described fundamentally as an idea, I think, um, need to be an architecture that is designed and built? And if it were an architecture, what would some of its key features be? And um, finally, would embodying the idea of the commons as architecture set it up for failure? as the relationship between architecture and capital seems characterized by the power of the capitalist class. Yeah, oh my God, yes, the, the, the architecture revolution. Yes, you know, I think there have been so many attempts already in the United States made, you know, but uh, not only in the United States. I, I don't know, I mean, uh, I have images as, um, have you seen uh, images of uh, traditional Kurdistan villages? Ah, okay. So the Kurdistan villages um, uh, in, in Turkey and so on were villages where practically, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we have to do that, right? But it's an, it's an extreme model. <laughs> but these were villages where practically you went you went from one home to the next throughout the village without interruption. And I don't know how to describe, to describe it, but let's imagine houses in which the street feels part of the connective link of every house. Instead of separating the houses, it connects the houses. So you go from one place to the next and everything is connected. Now it doesn't have to be that way, but certainly the restructuring of the home and restructuring of the urban environment go together, right? We cannot think of changing the home without changing you know, urban planning. So changing urban planning is according to a principle of creating spaces where people can come together, creating spaces right, where children can play, creating spaces that are safe, spaces for collective gathering. You know? In, uh, if you go to Europe, you will see, for instance, most of the towns were pre-capitalist, built in pre-capitalist period, and there's always is a square. There is a little square, there is a little big, big or small, because these were places where people came together. When I moved to the United States, I spent the first two, three months looking for the square. <laughs> because the square used to be the center of the town, the heart of the town. And uh, I moved to Buffalo I came the first years of my in the States and every weekend I went off on a search for where the town is. And later I realized that I had to change my concept of what is a town. But to give an idea, the spaces, for example, where people can come together, um, uh, homes that are not separated, they do not separate people. That even the homes, you know, ha have spaces, building with space where those of the residents can join, can talk, can decide, can make collective decision. So I think this this is what uh, uh, architects now should should propose should fight for it. Um, there are many, many experiments, you know, um, in Zurich, for example, you know, a whole 
lots of people have taken over an industrial, an early industrial complex and turn it into habitation. It's called Kraftenwerke. And it's a hundreds of people who do have their own apartments, but the place is full of collective spaces. You know? And uh, you know, places to eat together, to have assemblies, uh, to exchange things, to have guests if their guests are coming. The idea is every place should have possibility for others coming from the outside and staying with us, right? So really opening up, mm, conceiving the urban space for the collectivity rather than for individual units. Thank you. And of course, I know the, the, the drive now is in the opposite direction, right? The mini, mini, mini apartment, so that if you want to do anything, you have to go to a cafe and, and spend money, right? You have to bring your computer to a place where you have to spend some money. Or the high rise building from which you're separated, you know, from, uh, from the ground and you have no control, no connection with what is happening in the street. The street is a very important, important place of commoning, right? But now it's dominated by the car. So liberating this, the street also, right? For the encounter and not having it taken over by cars and trucks. So all of that, there is a tremendous amount of transformation that has to take place. Um, and to top it off, I live close to Prospect Park. And I have to say that for thousands of people, the park has been the salvation during the COVID epidemic and has been transformed. Uh, I've walked into the park for many, many years. And the last two years, the park has become you know, people have been able to be there, not to feel safe in it. And they have uh, created incredible amount of activities that used to be done in the home or in closed spaces, now done into the park, uh, particularly with children and so on. So I, I think it's very inspirational that COVID is now generating new ideas of people of how to live. So we have a comment from, from Alicia, Alicia. Hello, Marta. I'm sorry, I, 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 the background, I can't have the camera on. Okay, that's fine. Okay, hi, Mar Marta, Cesare, and uh, Silvia. Thank you so immensely much. I'm a, um, a professor at Pratt Institute and um, an avid, just inspired by you. So it's more a comment. Just thank you for this evening. It has um, been incredible um, to have Marta Cesare open up um, City College to all of us, your brilliant students to hear Nandini and the questioning and you uh, inspire and open my mind on a daily basis. That's, that's all. <laughs> it was oh, more like, like, a, like, like, like gratitude. I, I would turn the camera on, but it's like not okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And I'm probably footsteps away from you. So <laughs> so I think, so, I think, thank you, Alicia. Thanks. Very, very kind of you. And I would just say that, that Nandini is probably highly flattered to be taken for a student, but she is in fact a dear colleague of ours. No, no, I do not. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I had my first teaching job at, at City College in 1993 to four. So my my deep respect and um, admiration and for Silvia Federici, uh, your work is so important and so critical um, in this time post COVID. And um, I, I, I think bringing attention to your work in a way, um, and I, I, I really like so thankful to my colleagues at City College for having me be able to speak, to be able to see you. And I hope to see you in Prospect Park. Good, good, good. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> And I should turn my camera on. <laughs> Fine. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're welcome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it was more a share. So yeah, completely exactly. inspiring. I wrote to Marta this. This was the most inspiring uh, conversation that I've been in all year. And um, so I didn't mean to speak, but thank you so very much. Oh, they're very generous. And I definitely <laughs> would like to meet you for a walk in the park. Okay, <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I think, Sylvia, this is a tribute to the spirit of commenting that you inspire in people, exactly. right? <laughs> ah, that, that's, that's very, it gives me a lot of joy. Yeah, right. So are there, are there other comments? Oh, Ali, please. Hi, Sylvia. <clears throat> I'm oh. sorry. It's, a, it's an honor to, to be here and hear your voice. Uh, I've, uh, I've been always a big fan of your work. Um, you also have worked on the idea of uh, witches and witch hunts yeah. as the people who were marginalized, as the people yeah. who were no, no more useful as workers and all sorts of violence that then was brought upon them. And it looks like as capital has moved from a production system to a financial system, as uh, automation has made a lot of workers basically useless. Uh, and in many other ways, it looks like that the so-called army of unemployed is now has grown so much that it's its own other world and it's so big that it somehow it needs to now start organizing itself as the one on the side, uh, like we see in Brazil, the, yes. the homeless and occupations and so on that, that happen in the cities. Uh, I just wanted to know your opinion and see if you see any uh, potentials or, or any risk yeah. in that condition. I, I think, first of all, we have to reject the idea that uh, the machines are replacing human beings. Because although it's true and it's been true all through the history of capitalism, that you know, changes, technological changes in particular areas of industry are throwing dozens of people on the streets. And sometimes people who will never work again because of age, et cetera. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, we know that the history of technology you know, is a history that is driven you know, by the need to destroy struggles, to destroy forms of organization. So the history of technological development is always been a history of uh, that has a class basis, right? But nevertheless, you know, even with all the technological leaps and artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, I think we have to resist the idea because it's an idea that is used inculcated and uh, propagandized, you know, to make us feel that any struggle that we can do is going to be defeated and we should be grateful for any crumbs that we get. So I think it's very important. And it's not just a question of keeping up a good image. I think it's a reality. You go to Brazil, you go to all, all over Latin America, Everybody's working. They're doing informal work. They're doing work that is not recognized by capitalism. It's not true. The people are now, you know, actually very few people. And now, of course, people are being destroyed and people who give up and people are, and people are incarcerated. But even the people are incarcerated who are working. So it's not true that people are not is that they are doing the kind of informalization, informal labor, the cartoneros, for example. You go through Brazil or in Argentina and you see everywhere there's huge amount of people who are working, picking up this, picking up that, like the cartoneer, and uh, a tremendous amount of work of the production. Uh, the work that it takes to care, for example, for a sick person, that it's immense. So the idea that capitalism abolishes labor, it's pure propaganda. In reality, if there are lay enough people and if I'm making some people disposable, it's because it's part of a 
you know, is a, it's, it's a political decision, not because the work is not needed. Tell me, what is the machine that can take, take place? You know, the space, I, I replace a mother, for example, who has a five months old, yeah? Is enough to look at a, a nurse, is enough to look at a person who cares for somebody who has, uh, a, particularly in the field of reproductive work, as somebody who's dealing with uh, somebody who has a chronic disease. And you will see there is a 24 hours work. You know? So I think we have to be very careful and not accept the idea and see the fact that they are making people dispensable. You know? not a fact of, of technological development, but a political decision-making. It's a war that is being made. This is my view, that it is a war that is, is made on people. It's a war that it is made on people, not because you know, the work is not, is not there. Look at the nursing home. The reason so many people die in the nursing home is because they have been completely defunded. And often, you know, even before COVID only uh, intensified, a crisis that was there. Crisis meaning people with Alzheimer tied to their bed, given tranquilizer, given sleeping pills, et cetera, so that they would not have to be taken care of nurses who have five, six, seven people to bathe in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole tale, there's a whole story. And the results in many dying in nursing home or even being abused, you know, pre previous to the COVID. So I think we have to be really careful when we speak about what technology is doing. Because if you look, for example, at social relation and economics from the point of view of reproduction, you will see that the need, the work is immense. Uh, and so we have to really respond in a different way. It's not the machines who are actually making people disposable. It's a politics, it's a decision. It's a very perverse system, you know? who accumulate by forcing some to work 24 hours and by making others, you know, completely resourceless. To, to clarify, I, I wasn't trying to make that point. I, I think that the overlap between your work on the work at home and domestic work mm -hmm. and all this sort of gig economy that actually we saw through COVID, for example, uh, a lot of people couldn't have food if, for example, all these deliveries didn't exist. So the, exactly what you said, the making things informal, showing that or uh, pretending that uh, the capital doesn't care or is not interested in certain workers. It doesn't mean that they don't work or their work is not valuable. Exactly. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the point. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Are we, do we have other questions? No questions. Oh, Kristen. Hi. Um, hello. 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 I actually uh, um, had a kind of follow-up question to Matthew's uh, regarding just, does the architecture of the potential commons not need or even reject uh, architects? As a kind of explanation, it sort of it feels like the relationship building and the healing and the commoning, that sort of process uh, is something that is continuously thwarted by architects and planners in service of those with money. Um, and so it feels, I don't know, I guess my question is just like, do you feel like there's a need for architects?
It's a question to me or to Matthew? Oh no, it's for it's for you. But um, I mean, it's open to anyone, I guess, to answer or to think about. <laughs> I my my answer is that yeah, I think it's very important. I you know the architect actually develops certain skills that probably they also have to relearn. You know, even Ilich spoke about uh, you know uh, how intellectual I have to relearn much of the knowledge they have. Uh, you know, apprehended because it came from the wrong source. But uh, I think the question of architect is, yeah, if they work with communities, I think to what extent they can also embed themselves into the communities for whom, uh, or they are embedded with the corporate world. And uh, of course, uh, I know that these are not easy decisions to make, but, uh, this is the dividing line. There has to be a politics in every work. You have to make a political choice because uh, you know, every work has built into it that, uh, that, that contrast. You know, do we reproduce capital or we reproduce our communities? And I look forward, for example, you know, to struggles in every wage workplace, you know, where people will struggle not only for the hours of work, compensation, social relief, but also what is that we are producing, for instance. I think I look forward to a time where people stop producing, you know, things that are destructive for the community. Uh, for instance, that that becomes a union demand. No, we don't want to, de to produce things that are we know are going to destroy. For example, workers in a you know, war factory, in a factory that produces guns and bombs, etc. But not only that, not only that. So I think that these are decisions, right? What is the politics of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis? What is the consequences of what we do, right? And uh, that's a question for architects as well. Thank you. There are more questions in the chat, uh, perhaps uh, one by Elena and one by Premal. You guys want to ask it yourself? Sure. Um, hi, Silvia. Hello. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for being here. Like everyone else, I'm completely blown away. Um, so my question has more to do with reproductive work. So yeah. I'm just wondering if reproductive work is likened to production in creating and rearing consumers, um, to what ex extent would accepting wages for this work be a concession to the capitalist system? Um, and would it possibly deter from ideas of the common then um, maybe, maybe more problematic uh, by the logic that reproduction is production of consumers, would true subversion be the halting of reproduction entirely, um, at least momentarily? Oh, yeah, no, I, I understand the question. And I think uh, the, uh, the struggle for wages for housing has been, you know, very, very, very misunderstood because, uh, you know, in our, you know, I, I've often said we never conceived it as a kind of near it as, a, as an end point not as an end point, this is like revolution, we are going to be paid for the work we do, right? Not as a union demand, right? Give us this money and we'll be happy, right? But we saw as a, a, a tool to, for two, two things. One, to subvert the whole organization of the productive work, right? In other words, uh, you know, this work has been organized in a certain way because it's been unpaid, because it's been naturalized, because et cetera, et cetera. And that is men that has locked women, has locked women in a very, very, very difficult position because the fact that this work, and I've written it many times, the fact that this work has not been seen as work, but as a personal service, has also made it very difficult to fight against it. 
right? I mean, the classical situation that uh, you think you're fighting against your son, you're fighting against your daughter, you're fighting against your husband. You know, the way it has been constructed in this cocoon that is the family, where all around you is, is relation that are supposed to be a relation of solidarity and love, et cetera, et cetera. And yet you are exhausted, you have all this work, and yet you are dependent. And yet you have to go through the humiliation of depending on a man for your wage. This has been the classical situation for many women, at least in, in working class families, right? Uh, so this is what the wages for housing was supposed to unblock. And we always saw it as a, a moment in a longer struggle, not as an end point, but as a moment in a longer struggle. First of all, to reveal what this work is about. Who are the real beneficiary? Break women's dependence on men. Put women in direct relation to capital. Saying, yeah, we are working for the collective capital, right? Wages for housing from the state, right? So it was supposed to change the nature of the struggle. Take it away from that really cocoon that is the family, the private, the domestic, which for women has been such a form of entrapment. And uh, you know, so I think this is where a, a lot of, uh, of criticism that has come that we wanted to institutionalize women in the womb. Exactly the opposite was the case. And so many women knew it. They would say to us, I'm already institutionalized. I am institutionalized. I don't have the money to pay for a bus ticket. You know, I don't have any money that I have to ask him. They will say, if I have to buy socks, you know, so number, number one, no? And uh, it is also the fact that today money remains, you know, one of the gates to survival. So we are fighting for the commons, but we cannot forget also the struggle within monetary relation. You know, I think that the, the, the struggle that involves monetary relation is a struggle that is very, very treacherous. And you know, you're right, you know, the struggle has to be conducted in a way you know, that lifts the bottom for everybody. Very often wage struggle you know, are conducted in a way that satisfy a sector of the working class, but at the expense of another. You know? We didn't think that this was the case. And in fact, when we were struggling for wages for housework, and this was in fact very much present to us, there was already a strong struggle of women, mostly black women, for welfare. You know, the struggle of welfare mothers, right? Uh, who were saying, I mean, my God, if the fact that is our child, is the problem, we will swap our children, right? So because, you know, nobody recognizes that we are working when the child is our own, you know? So to us, the struggle of women, and they were saying, this is the only money that allow us to give us some, to get some autonomy, right? Otherwise we would have to go out get any job whatsoever, accept any working condition whatsoever. So to us, this was a, an in-between. It was a lever to change the power relation you know, for many, many, many women, the majority of women in relation to the state, right? And, uh, you know, we talk about the commons, even the Zapatistas who have created the most communal society still sell their, their coffee and uh, earn money by selling their coffee on the market. Because we are surrounded by capitalist relation. 
and money is still in many cases irreplaceable. So you have to make a struggle that looks at the future, right? It doesn't mean, look, would you, for example, go and tell all the teachers at City College to give up their wages because this confirms the, the capitalism, right? Nobody would have uh, go and tell wage worker, why are you taking wages? By taking wages, you are confirming a capitalist economy, right? Yet, you know, when uh, we spoke about wages, five, uh, oh no, wages, oh no, you're going to confirm capitalism, you're going to confirm capitalism. But none, nobody who say that, for example, university professors should give up their wages because by taking wages, they are in fact institutionalizing, you know, the wage system, right? So I think that we have to be coherent <laughs> and recognize that, uh, you know, when you make a struggle, you have to look not only how to affect a particular group of people, but how to affect the whole. And uh, if it actually is a struggle that expands the power, right, of, uh, of people as a whole, it is a struggle that reclaims wealth that is being taken away from the community, that brings back to the community wealth and resources that might otherwise be used against us. Imagine a trillion was spent in Afghanistan to destroy Afghanistan, more than a trillion. Imagine if that trillion had been used uh, to support the reproduction of families, you know, across the United States. Imagine, right? So I think we have to uh, realize that uh, this struggle have strategies to have some strategic thinking. Mm. Premo, you want to jump in? Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for your lecture. I think you can just tell by the passion that the other professors have and just by talking how much you mean and to everybody. Um, I did just have a question that you kind of touched on right now um, that you have to do this challenge within the context of today's reality of capitalism, the Zapatistas that's um, trading their, their coffee. I was just wondering in your opinion, um, through your work or just through your um, knowledge, do you, do you have an ideal uh, society or a nation that you can meet is, or gets closest to your ideal goals right now? Or is there something that you that you can point to that's happening into any nation or society now, I guess? Not really, but uh, I think that, for example, the, the struggle of the Zapatistas has been very, very, very inspirational. Yeah, very much. And uh, I've also been inspired by talking to a lot of women in Latin America both about uh, you know indigenous communities from which they have come you know and uh, you know the fact that some indigenous community where at the time you are nine or ten ah very beautiful girl uh, from the time you're ten you know you're part of the community there's something that people will ask you to do your your this sense of, of being connected that even people go away and migrate they will do something for the community because it's so important to them, you know, and it's not an obligation, but it's something they want to do, you know, and the tech, you know, the being uh, this kind of collective work, this has been also very inspirational. And uh, the women in uh, the, you know, favelas or the Villa Miserias who, very proudly could say, you know, this we have built with our hands and this we have done and organizing so many things, organizing alternative forms of healthcare, organizing the committee for the glass of milk, organizing the collective kitchen. This to me is the world, you know, uh, that, that inspires me, that tells me, yeah, we are in a terrible, unjust world, 
but there's also a lot of struggle. And, so and just, a struggle that is building something, you know, that is keeping people alive and alive not only physically, not only provide <laughs> like the <laughs> they not only provide food for a lot of, but they also create a community. Women are talking to each other, they are not alone in the kitchen. And there is young people and there are people and so on, they're sharing information, they're talking politics, they're talking about what happened to each other, they're sharing their crisis. It creates, it is a new world that is created, for example, in a collective kitchen. It's not the people just, you know, uh, are cooking together. You know, there's a whole new set of the emotional and, and, and knowledge that is transmitted.